democracy is a very simple thing. Uh, we will go into the understanding of democracy of the beginning of the 90s uh, with uh, further detail as uh, something coming from the background of our countries. Uh, but democracy uh, was not the rule of the majority at the beginning. Democracy for us at the beginning of the 90s was a tool to counteract dictatorship. It was very simple. It was not about everybody being equal. It is not about everybody, everybody being rich. It was about dismantling dictatorship. And there was no other way but free elections. I will come to this later. This is Balsarovic's 7.1. He, he actually formulated 10. Uh, but, you know, because some of them, you know, uh, basically go on, one on to another. Um, he developed this plan between September and December 1989. It was the first plan for reform in our countries. Poland today is the only country from the former complex communist camp uh, which entered the, 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 the club of the richest nations uh, in the world. It qualifies, you know, for uh, the uh, 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 for for that club, and this is the only country for the time being from our uh, from our region. So the plan was very simple. The plan was uh, no state guarantees for state-owned enterprises. So everybody should be treated equally in terms of uh, economic whatever management. Uh, classic banking rules. So, uh, interest rates should be uh, real, not subsidized. This goes into the third point as well. No credit guarantees or subsidized interest to anybody, including government, including state-owned enterprises. Uh, tax on rising salaries. Uh, it was a very interesting, uh, a very interesting point in uh, uh, in Balcerovich's plan. For this reason, it's called shock therapy. So the idea was, I mean, the currency is zloty, which is mean golden, yeah. But the zlotys were not very golden. You know, they, they were subject to to hyperinflation. Uh, and the idea was, you know, that if an enterprise or an institution raises salaries by two zlotys, so then the tax is two zlotys. If they raise the salary with five zlotys, then the tax is ten zlotys. So the, the more you raise the, 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 the salary, the higher the tax you pay. Otherwise, you know, you have a normal treatment by everyone, by everyone. Equality before the law meant in economic terms, equality before the tax laws. So there was no preferential treatment on any taxpayer in the country, be this an enterprise, be this a government institution, be this a private organization or a private enterprise. So the next, which was very important, was equal treatment of foreign direct investment. So local investors, local enterprises, and foreign enterprises, they're equal before the law. <coughs> the next, which was very important, was to implement normal rules of uh, foreign exchange transactions. Uh, the foreign exchange, foreign exchange transactions were freed, absolutely, but with one restriction. The restriction was that in the jurisdiction of Poland, only the zlotys are to be used. So if you wish to repatriate profits or whatever, if you're a foreign investor, you basically exchange your zlotys, you know, to the currency you would need, wish to, 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 to have. For example, uh, Deutschmark or dollars or whatever. Uh, 
because customs are also tax, and when you free uh, the, uh, the the economy, so you should also free the trade. So the customs will not to be used as a preferential treatment of every, of, of anybody in the country. So the equality before the customs or customs treatment. Uh, of all the subjects of the country was absolutely important. And there were two laws, which is basically one, uh, which was freeing the, uh, the, 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 the employment market. Uh, so the, the, the story, the background of this story in Poland was the following. From 1st of, uh, of January, 89, the ex-communist country, uh, country, Poland, introduced the uh, Economic Freedom Act. Economic Freedom Act meant only one very simple thing. Because before 89, any private ownership or private enterprise was a crime. So the Freedom Act basically stated that everybody has the right to do whatever they want with their own money, producing what they want and selling at what the price they like to, to uh, or they can agree with uh, with the buyers. So the only segment of the market which did, was not touched by uh, the Economic Freedom Act of uh, of eighty nine, it was all, all under the communism, uh, 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 not uh, uh, not before they had round table, they had. Uh, negotiations, they elected a new government, Tadeusz uh, Mazowiecki's uh, government, where uh, Balcerowicz was uh, uh, deputy prime minister and the minister of finance. So, the only non free segment of the economy uh, was, uh, and it was a big issue actually, because the, the reforms in Poland started with solidarity, with trade unions. So, the only non free segment of the economy was uh, uh, was the supply and demand of labor and it was absolutely important so uh, this plan was adopted by the parliament by the same uh, on 29th of december 89 and about three months later you know Botsirovich was almost fired eventually he left the government but nobody can couldn't do anything else but these things. So now about the results. So this is our countries, uh, the world, and, uh, uh, and, and, and Western Europe. So if you go to the middle of the 40s, which is the end of the World War II, the countries were basically comparable uh, in terms of uh, uh, GDP per capita. So, what happened to our countries? These are Eastern Europe, the green, uh, uh, the green line. So, what happened was that they were growing a little bit slower than the Western Europe until the beginning of uh, of the eighties, and then they started declining in terms of GDP per capita, and they fall uh, by the mid nineties at about 15% uh, below the world average, which basically means that in the world you include, you know, India, China, and other poor countries, Africa, and that sort of stuff. We were poor, you know, compared to the rest of the world. And so what is now, we are about 30% richer than the rest of the world. Uh, this is the same comparing France Romania and Bulgaria. So you see, you know, our two countries were basically uh, uh, the same. Uh, you see, you know, the economy is declining, you know, in the in the in the beginning of the eighties. Uh, you see, France, you know, we we were basically, I mean, about uh, hundred forty, hundred fifty years, we were basically comparable. So France was uh, a bit richer. So uh, that's uh, relatively normal. Uh, so we were on the same uh, 
economic development pact, basically. We were developing together with Western Europe or France. So what happened after the World War II, you know, the difference between our countries, you know, our two countries and France, you know, is going large. So, and if you take, you know, 89, which is here, so it is like uh, uh, seven times difference. So we were, if at the beginning of the 20th century, our countries compared to France were twice poorer, so at the, at the end of the, of the 80s, we were seven times poorer than, uh, uh, than, than France. And this was basically the impact of, uh, of the Soviet or the communist system. Uh, so if you take the real GDP, so the, the, the situation is not that, I mean, this is how much we can buy with our cash, yeah, uh, we have. So, and we have here, you know, Poland, France, uh, Bulgaria, and Romania. So, but still, you know, it's obvious that the life in France is, uh, is, uh, is, is, uh, is, is much better. Because, you know, with the cash, they can buy more things. So, this, this is a life expectancy. So, at the beginning of the 90s, we believe that, uh, you know, we do some things in the democracy area, then we do some things in the economic area, and suddenly, you know, we start living better. So, and this, is, this graph is the life expectancy. And here we have Germany, uh, which is the yellow, uh, France, which is sort of uh, purple, and we have Poland, Bulgaria, and Romania. What is here the, the most interesting thing? These are our three countries, yes? So from the mid 50s until, until 89, the life expectancy was not developing at all. So it was basically flat. Life expectancy is not a thing, you know, that, which may improve overnight. So it basically go, goes very slowly. So what happens actually is that after 89, so our life expectancy, we live better and we live longer. Because we live better, we live longer. But still, you know, there is a difference, you know, in the life expectancy. And this is a measure of the quality of life. Uh, this is all of our countries compared to some countries are really good, you know, like uh, the Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia. So countries somewhere between us and, uh, and Western Europe, Germany, France. Uh, so, and all of us, as I said, you know, all of us are much better than, uh, than the world. So, Bulgaria is about 20%, uh, Romania is about 25% better than the world, you know, and the others uh, are better than, than us. But still, not that developed compared to Western Europe. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, the richest of our countries, you know, how they spent uh, on uh, uh, on pensions, on healthcare, uh, social aid, and uh, so-called social inclusion. So the difference is, uh, uh, is 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 very visible. So we spent, I mean, our richest countries, you know, they spent less than than Germany or Sweden. If you have questions about Germany and Sweden, I can tell you the story there. This is the government spending, you know, we had. Um, so, the most interesting country here is Bulgaria. This is the only country on, in the Northern Hemisphere, which for a period of about uh, 50 years was increasing its government spending. This is government spending, including interest on foreign debt. So, Bulgaria was always, you know, increasing its foreign debt, and that's why... Uh, so, why the country like Bulgaria would increase the foreign debt? The same was the story with Romania, actually. Romania is the red one, so it's, uh, it's up, up to here. So, Romania had, you know, First increase of, uh, of its debt, you know, in the beginning of, uh, of, of, of the communist regime, then it declined. Then in the 60s, you know, it, uh, it had risen 
to about 40% of, uh, uh, of GDP. And then again, Ceausescu decided to pay foreign debts and the country basically started dying. I'm sorry, <laughs> no, but that was the story. Uh, you know, I, I, my first visit to, I, I was a boy, about 12, 13 years old. My first visit to Bucharest was just like going into paradise, you know. So it was so much different, you know, compared to, uh, to, to Bulgaria. And it was different because, I mean, you could have buy Coca-Cola and other things, you know, uh, jeans. Uh, so, and it, was, and it was different because Ceausescu was spending all this money to bribe Romanians. So, Bulgarian government, you know, was bribing Bulgarians longer than, uh, uh, than uh, the Romanian government. And for this reason, you know, it was borrowing for a longer period of time, you know, since the end of the 40s until, until the end of the 90s. Uh, a, a parallel development to, to this borrowing was that Bulgaria is the only country from the former communist camp which managed to default on its foreign debt three times. Once in 1955, once in 1976, and once in 1985. Nobody was defaulting as often as Bulgaria in the 20th century. So, but the first two defaults, the first two defaults were after the Balkan Wars at the beginning of, uh, of the century. And then the, the, the First World War started. Uh, because Bulgaria was fighting, you know, all the fronts, you know, to the west, to the south, and to the north, you know, Bulgaria used to have, you know, the largest army in the world and the largest spending on, uh, on, on, on defense or war. Uh, so, and it defaulted in 1915. Then, with everybody else in 33-34, it defaulted once again. So, then, there was no country in Europe to default, but at the end of the, uh, of the communist regime, it was Poland. So Bulgaria and Poland defaulted again in the, in the mid-90s, and Bulgaria defaulted, managed to default once again in 1997. 1997. Uh, but it, this time it was of, on the domestic debt, and the domestic debt was, uh, uh, was uh, basically three times GDP. Uh, so, what is interesting here is that if you take Germany, for example, our government, our countries, all of us, all of us, had higher costs of government, including foreign debt, than Germany during the war. And Bulgaria, you know, he is Bulgaria, Bulgaria managed to have government uh, uh, expenditures equal to the United Kingdom during the war. United Kingdom, uh, because it was the first country to fight Germany, uh, it was the most heavily indebted country in the world. So their debt was about foreign debt, most of the United States, uh, was about three times GDP, 270% of GDP. Uh, and eventually, United Kingdom paid its debt to the United States uh, in 2007. So Bulgaria paid its debt, you know, to, to all the creditors, but they were private creditors uh, uh, in 2004-2005. Sorry? Okay, yeah. yeah. So, uh, why life is, is so attractive in Germany? So, uh, this is not so much the life expectancy if, if you see the quality of life and that sort of stuff, although it's important. So, life is better because of one very simple fact. So, when you go there, you're more productive, so you gain more. So, this is the difference between our countries and the productivity of Germany. So, the dynamics after, after 1990 is basically equal. So the German productivity is, 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 is growing up and our productivity is growing up. But the difference is there. So if I would like to, of course there are other 
well, good things about uh, about Germany, you know. But if if I'm a, for example, nuclear physicist or astronomer, I would rather go and work, you know, in Switzerland or Germany rather than staying, you know, at the University of Sofia because, you know, I cannot apply basically what I know. Although we have and you have, you know. Lots of uh, astronomers and uh, natural scientists and uh, computer specialists and that sort of stuff who are globally competitive, but they're globally competitive because they're globally competitive. So basically, you can uh, be in the software, internet, or uh, computer science or industry, uh, irrespective of your, your 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 country of of residence. So you can. Uh, work in New Zealand and uh, for an American company, you know, from or Canadian company, or you may be based on the moon and you will be equally productive. So, but if you go, you know, more classic, uh, uh, classic stuff, you know, the production, the productivity is very different. You know, between. So, one of the things we, we are witnessing now is, uh, uh, is, 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 is changing the, the, the view on the past. So I, I would like to focus now on what was uh, the past. So the so-called transition, if you go back to the Balcerovich plan, so there was nothing special in the Balcerovich plan. So what was uh, basically the plan what was, uh, is, is the following. So let's make uh, money, normal, legal tenders. So before 89, in Poland, Bulgaria, Romania, and everywhere, the monies were not monies, the monies were lottery tickets. So you go to, uh, to a shop, and if there are bananas, you buy bananas. If they're, you know, like uh, toilet paper, you buy toilet paper. We had a joke about uh, toilet paper, but the economy was sh on, based on shortages, was producing shortages. And because the economy is producing shortages, so then the money is lottery ticket. So we had the following whatever economic joke on, uh, uh, economist joke on, uh, on toilet paper. The question is why there is a shortage of toilet paper in Bulgaria? And the answer is very sim simple. There is a shortage on toilet paper because it is planned, the production of toilet paper is planned per capita. But it happened that there are more assholes than capitas in the country. <laughs> Another thing which was very important is to, to, to uh, 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 to, to, to free the prices. Prices <coughs> were not prices. The prices were not a matter of negotiation between a, 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 a seller and a buyer. Prices were taxes. So why? Because, I mean, let's take, uh, let's take Bulgarian government because I know it better, you know, of that period. So in when Bulgarian government defaulted in 76. So they needed, you know, for urgent matters, you know, for example, supporting the army, they urgently needed, you know, about $2 million. How you raise $2 million? So one thing is to print money, but it goes into inflation, so it's not very good. So what, uh, uh, what the government did, this is to increase the, the, the prices on Suica. So everybody drinks Suica, yeah? So what, what they do, you know, they raise the price, you know, from, uh, uh, say, uh, $1.50, you know, to four, uh, to uh, one left 50, and they raise the price, the price to three lefts. So, and in two months, you know, they collect, you know, this money that you need. So, uh, so the rest, hard budget constraints is very important. In order to have all these policies implemented, you should have the politicians liking the market economy, respecting the private property. So this happened even before, as we know very well, 
from the Polish example, from uh, uh, from the Hungarian example, from the Hungarian example, uh, from Romanian example, this happened even before '89. So our countries, you know, uh, uh, were trying, you know, to somehow stick to the basic rules of the uh, uh, of the market economy, but they were constantly failing. So one of the failures was to be explained by uh, by 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 by, by quasi-common market of, uh, of, the, uh, of the Council of Mutual Economic Assistance. Uh, part of the failure was to be explained by, by the Iron Curtain, and part of the failure was to be explained by, by the Warsaw Pact. So the Warsaw Pact has a very important function. If a country wants to flee the communist camp, so there was a Warsaw Pact to invade the country. So when which we know very well, you know, from uh, from from Czechoslovakia. Luckily, you know, Romania was not part of that invasion. Uh, if the government, or if the people were fleeing, you know, our countries, there was there was an iron curtain. Uh, the iron curtain was there, you know, from 1948. Uh, so uh, then, the communist leader. Uh, of East Germany, of GDR. Walter Ulbricht was sending every month a letter, you know, to Stalin and then to Khrushchev and asking, please, Comrade Stalin, you know, allow me to build a wall in Berlin. So, and the first, you know, they didn't understand what's going on, but then there was an explanation. About one million Germans, Eastern Germans, were living, you know, every two years, you know, to West Germany. So the Situation was unbearable. Between 48 and uh, uh, and and and, uh, and 1960, about 40% of the East German population left for for West Germany. The only way, you know, to keep them was, you know, to build a wall. So our countries were much more uh, easy in this respect, you know. So it was a domestic affair. The year I was born. I won't tell which year is this. Um, One thousand one hundred eighteen Bulgarians left the country. This is for one year, and one uh, and one hundred twenty foreigners came to the country. So, if you look at data today, so about seven hundred thousand. Bulgarians leave the country every month. Of course, you know, these are tourists, you know, they come and go, they have work and that sort of stuff. So the country was closed when I was born, absolutely closed. Of course, you know, of these 1,000 something, you know, probably half of those, you know, were, uh, were government and, and Communist Party functionaries, you know, everybody else, you know, was kept. So it is believed that on the Iron Curtain and the Berlin Wall, because of the shoot to kill policy of these German border guards, it is believed that about 1,000 individuals were killed. So the data about East Germans killed on Bulgarian border with Turkey and, uh, and, and Greece is twice more. So about 2,000 Germans were killed by, uh, by Bulgarians. I mean, this is a figure which, I mean, I can comment on this and that sort of stuff, which is probably not very realistic, but this is, a, this is an estimate. Uh, so this, this, these whatever six, seven criteria are the issues which were, or the policies which are first implemented in Poland, and then our countries basically <coughs> repeated the same, not because we liked Poland, but because there was no other thing to do. The entire reform was to make our economies, uh, the entire economic reform was to make our, uh, 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 our economies something normal. So, uh, democracy. Uh, democracy is a mean to fight dictatorship for one very simple reason. 
the entire resistance to communism was based uh, on Tuhana's uh, uh, website, which is Voices of, uh, uh, of, of the Victims. Uh, and the subtitle of the, is, is a historiography of the anti-communist literature. So, but it was much more important than... And then, all these, whatever, efforts uh, uh, created, uh, created a, a, a generation. And this generation of, of the 60s, I mean, irrespectively, the people killed on the Iron Curtain, irrespectively of uh, invasion of Hungary or invasion of Czechoslovakia, irrespectively the fact that there was a, a, a Warsaw Pact army in Central Europe, <coughs> irrespectively the fact that the Soviets installed nuclear warheads in, uh, uh, in, in, in Hungary and Czechoslovakia, especially Czechoslovakia, without even the Czechoslovaks knowing that there are they're, they're nuclear heads in their country, irrespective of all this, you know, the, the, the mood, the drive for individual freedom remained, and the people who changed our countries, and I will come to the end now, the people who changed our countries belonged to the generation of the 60s, or the 68. There is no single person, even in Romania. Uh, so, uh, Iliescu, Petra Roman, you know, the first, whatever. Uh, <laughs> no, they, no, I, I mean, uh, 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 I, I know them personally, you know. Uh, but they belong to the 60s. They, I mean, with all the comments you might have on, uh, on their policies, on their uh, uh, friendships, you know, they had, you know, especially... Uh, Ilyasko, he was a friend of, uh, of, of Gorbachev. And actually, Gorbachev, uh, uh, I mean, his view on, on Eastern Europe in uh, the second half, especially after Chernobyl, uh, on Eastern Europe was that he has friends in all, in all our countries. So Ilyasko in, uh, uh, in, in Bucharest, you know, Andrei Lukanov, Petr Mladenov in Sofia, uh, Miklos Nemet in, uh, in, in Budapest, uh, Michael Maestrich in, uh, in, in Prague and that sort of stuff. I mean, he had a clear idea, Jaruzelski in Warsaw. I mean, he had a clear idea what he wants and he wanted his friends, you know, to run the countries. It did not happen. So, even Ilyasko has, has to go, you know. <laughs> I mean, he was forced to... to uh, now, in none of our countries, you know, we had, you know, the, the plan of KGB and, uh, and, and Gorbachev being fulfilled. Even in former Soviet Union, you know, I mean, the Baltics, you know, it was clear. You know, they 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 gave up on 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 the Baltics, you know, as early as August uh, uh, August uh, eighty nine. Uh, they were not successful in uh, in the Caucasus. So Georgia, with all the troubles they had until uh, probably fifteen years ago, with all the troubles, they were very independent, you know, from uh, from ninety one. So. They failed everywhere. So, um, so what happened? Uh, those who, who are interested in political science, you know, they can go and uh, a, a German colleague, uh, uh, Stephen Albert, he created Stephen. Uh, he created a, an index which is called Good Country Index. I'm, I'm not sure I, I managed this morning, you know, to put it here, uh, but the Good Country Index is, uh, is something very interesting. So this is a country which is not harassing its neighbors. This is a country which is nice, you know, to its uh, own citizens. And these citizens basically like their country. That's a very interesting index. So, and if you go here and we see, you know, the early reforms, so we, had, we see Poland and everybody else, you know, because they were following, you know, they were doing what, what Balcerowicz was suggesting at the beginning, 
our countries were sort of reluctant, you know, of doing this. So we are relatively better than anybody else, you know, from uh, uh, you know, from the former Soviet camp. So when we go already, you know, uh, 17 years later, so all of us are in this uh, this camp, you know, part of uh, 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 part of the former Soviet Union are very close to us. Uh, these are the so-called Western Balkans, you know, Georgia. In many respects, Georgia is better than uh, than Bulgaria and Romania, by the way. So, and you have, you know, the former Soviet Union or the members of the Eurasian Union, you know, some somewhat uh, uh, lagging behind in terms of democracy. And uh, this is a combination <coughs> of uh, democratic indices and uh, and the transition indicators of. Uh, uh, so, going. To the whatever to the second part of these are a couple of slides. Uh, um, if we go to all these six seven criteria for uh, 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 for democracy and, uh, uh, and, and, and 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 market economy, so we will see <coughs> that polit pol political system which is in favor of private property and market was there since mid 80s and with the first elections of 1990 especially with the second elections you know all this whatever all this political system was confirmed so with the second elections what was also confirmed is the democrat the, demo the, the, the democratic arrangement of uh, of uh, of our country so the dictatorship was basically eradicated by democratic elections. So that does not necessarily mean that those who elect are perfect, you know, but this is normal. I mean, this is a peaceful change of government. Of course, some countries, you know, they may fight, you know, during uh, elections, you know, this is very typical for Albania. You know, they always fight, you know, but they stopped killing themselves, you know, in the last three elections, they, they, there is nobody killed, you know, so, so it's, it's basically normal. Prevailing private property was the most difficult thing. Uh, many countries, including Bulgaria and Romania, they were trying, you know, or Poland for that matter, they were trying to delay, you know, the so-called privatization, or in fact, this is de-etatization, this is kicking out the government, you know, from the economy. So, actually, the Privatization is defined by, by Václav Klaus as violent expropriation of state enterprises from the state bureaucracy. So, and it takes time, you know, because, I mean, I mean people like, you know, uh, being responsible for different things. Uh, you remember, you know, the, the, the first couple of, uh, of points in the Balcerovich's plan. So even in Poland, you know, privatization was not there until 97, 98. So, I mean, it was difficult even in Poland, you know, to take the control out of the state bureaucracy, the economic control out of the heads of the state bureaucracy. Market coordination, it was relatively simple. So, uh, and market coordination means that you basically close everything which is inefficient. It requires time, but it also has a cost. So, because if you have the money functioning like a lottery ticket, you know, whenever you have the real exchange rate or real money, you know, you basically pay the cost, you know, of what has been the system before. Hard budget constraints uh, 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 was also very important. Uh, they were achieved in all of our countries with some whatever delays and that sort of stuff. For about two years, <coughs> the bias market <coughs> or the prices and that sort of stuff and political pluralism, you know, it was already there in 1990. So, what happens today? These are the political parties. So, part of the problem today is that people are that rich that they don't understand that they're rich. So, if you look at if you and, and there is something like uh, like a Kuznets political curve, you know. So uh, uh, if you look at, I mean, if you remember the first slides, you know, and if you look at the long history of uh, 
of prosperity of our countries, none of these countries had ever lived a better life than today. So, of course, there are differences remaining and that sort of stuff. But if you look at all of our countries, you know, we are richer than any other time in our history. So, part of the problem in the first years of communism was that Czechoslovakia was richer, obviously, than Germany or Austria. Hungary was richer than Austria. Bulgaria was twice richer, okay, 50% richer than, uh, than Greece. So in the 30 years of communism, you know, we were three times poorer than, than Greece. So the same was Romania's situation, because as you remember, you know, we were basically on the same level all the time. Uh, Romania is, thanks God, you know, richer now. Uh, but, you know, compared to Greece, which was one of the poorest countries uh, in Europe, uh, you know, we were in the, in, 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 in the late 80s, you know, we were three times poor. Romanians were even more poor than us, you know, but, but this is because of, uh, because of, uh, because of uh, the policies related to the foreign debt. Uh, so, we have, in Bulgaria, we have still, this is for Ivor. Uh, we have still a saying, you know, you look desperate like a German. You know? <laughs> Why? Because in the 20s, after the World War I, Bulgaria and Romania, they were countries which were attracting, you know, because of hyperinflation and other things, you know, the Germans were not very good at finding jobs, you know, in their own country. They were coming to our countries, you know, to, and we still have this saying, you know. So, if the countries were left alone after the World War II, we would have been much better, probably not as rich as France or Germany today, but close to that, close to Austria, close to, say, uh, Italy and that sort of stuff. So, but irrespectively of this, there is no if in the, in the history, but irrespectively to this history, uh, we are now richer than any other time. So, if you are a politician today in my country, or Poland, or Slovakia, or the Czech Republic, or Hungary, what you would do in order to win an office in a competitive political environment? <laughs> so, you would never speak about the successes of the last 30 years. You will always underline, you know, the difficulties of, all, of this last 30 years. So otherwise, you know, if you admit that everything was okay, you would basically confirm that Balcerovic has the right, you know, to be a prime minister again or, or a president of Poland. This is, this, is, this is not acceptable in terms of political competition. So all of the things, you know, we are facing today, a result of a of a free political competition, all the problems we have at, uh, uh, at, at political level with uh, uh, Nazi parties in, uh, in in Bulgaria, with uh, chauvinist parties in uh, the Czech Republic. So President Havel uh, was absolutely shocked when in the elections of 2003, this was one year before the formal entry of Czech Republic uh, 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 to the European Union, the Communist Party of the Czech Republic, it has a different name, it's uh, the Communist Party of Bohemia and Moravia, they made 13.5% in the elections. It was unbelievable. So you had the, the Prague Spring, you had the invasion, you had, you know, the, 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 the nuclear heads installed in, uh, in Czechoslovakia, and suddenly, you know, 20 years later, you have, or less than 20 years later, you have, you know, the Communist Party making very good uh, scores in the elections. Until recently, until the last European elections, the Communist Party of Bohemia and Moravia was the most active party in the European Parliament. Why is this? You know, it's, it's completely un ununderstandable. You, you cannot grasp it, you know, how it was possible to happen. One of the explanations is that 
in order to have a winning political campaign, you should disregard what was the success of the last 30 years, and you should focus on the successes of the previous period. There were no successes, and it's impossible to prove because of the statistics I gave, you know, but the life expectancy is just a summary of most of the things which were happening in our countries, you know, for the, the, uh, for the period between the World War II and 89. Another thing which is, uh, uh, which is very important today as a political, uh, uh, whatever, prerequisite of everything, or political condition of everything which is, uh, uh, which is happening, is the history of the political parties which were there to bring our countries to the membership of, to the status of a member of the European Union. So, as I said at the beginning, you know, the, the reforms were returning our countries to Europe. So, because the countries used to belong there. So, it was not a, a promise of a paradise on earth. So, nobody was promising, you know, that we will be rich overnight and that sort of stuff. So, uh, because there was no promise on the paradise of, on earth, now you have a promise on a paradise in our countries. How you become a paradise in your own country? Oh, it's very simple, you know, you, you basically blame the European Union because it's a complicated animal, nobody knows, you know, how it functions and that sort of stuff. Or you blame the foreigners. You know, they are exploiting our countries and that sort of stuff. So this rhetoric is, is very much there. Or, of course, you blame, uh, you, you, you blame the, 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 the immigrants or whatever. 